Greetings and salutations to all you folks out there. I am back. Back from a week and a half or so of vacation, which was amazing. The wedding and honeymoon to my lovely wife, who is sitting right over there across the room from me. Even better. And, uh, yeah, it's been fun. You guys have been enjoying some pre-recorded casts, although enjoying maybe a strong word, because I know some of those were a little bit pushed there towards the end, but... This week, I'm hoping to get back into the regular roll of things, and hopefully you'll be able to see um, my significant other at some point or another, uh, whether she's playing with me or whatnot. You will know her when you see her, because I'm sure everyone will point her out. Anywho, just a heads up, this week, um, anyone who is a Patreon supporter and who is over the threshold for the prizes, you can visit the Patreon page with the link underneath this video in the description and check that out um, you need to look at the prize tiers if you are qualifying for a prize tier those start next week so if you have replays that you want to submit or things that you need to talk to me about send me a message through the patreon website that way I know who everyone is and whether or not you actually are participating so that would be a huge help and you guys can go ahead and start enjoying that starting next week Without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into this game. It is a Wonder game. Quite fitting that I would come back to a game on Wonder. After all, 90% of FAF team player games happen on this that are not a sentence game. <laughs> and this one is going to be a Average Joe's ranked game. 900 to 1400. So hopefully this will give us some good entertainment. Let's go ahead and introduce the teams and we will jump straight into it. On the northern side, we've got Orion taking Aeon in the air slot, which is traditionally the correct thing to do. Eggroll has chosen Aeon as well in the right front slot. And we've got Defender taking UEF, Code Pants as Cybern, and that is the northern team at the left side. Take your pick. Silverwing has had trouble making up his mind. He started a land factory, then decided he didn't want it there and started another land factory. Probably misplaced his adjacency, so... We will forgive him for that. I think we've all done that at some point or another. That is Silverwing taking UEF in the appropriate silver color. Saz taking Aeon as a front player. Aeon popular for the front for some reason. I do not know why. Speedy Gonzalez taking Cybern and then an Aeon rear for Rage of 100 Suns. That sounds like a metal band. Perhaps he has one IRL. I do not know. He is going to go for the early Hydro. We've got one power generator down. And two P gens for Orion. You can technically rush the Hydra on this map, but sometimes it doesn't work out too fantastically well because it does put you fairly close to a power stall. You will finish your Hydro before the stall, but then when you start building additional power generators, you run into some power management issues. So one or two P gens before the walk is a good thing to do. And that pretty much goes for any map where you have a little bit of space between you and the Hydra. And here you can see a successful Hydro build with three mexes on the front. It just depends on what you're doing and how much of a stall you're willing to put up with. Because the Hydro does put out 100 power, but if you have nothing in storage and you're stalling, well, probably not worth it. Got a little bit of aggression in the early stage here. We've got a Hunter heading around the rear left. That looks like it had a run in with this Hunter, but it did survive, but it's going to get picked up by a Mantis. So, no successful rating for you, buddy and nothing else has been done it looks like except for this little guy there's a mech marine headed around the back interception by the tank a little bit of a dodge there but not quite enough the aurora is going to pick it off excellent touch with the long range there if that had been another t1 tank um, a fam or a striker I think that would have actually gotten through the mantis probably would have run it down the aurora had the extra range to pick it up so Good dealio there. And we got a Snoop sitting out front for a little bit of radar coverage. All right, that was the early game. Got a Mantis coming up on the left. Code Pants is going to be able to pick that up pretty easily, though. No problemo. Probably going after that Hunter there. Sitting still. Not really a threat, but oh, what have we here? This is my least favorite thing on Wonder. I do like playing the air slot here because you have plenty of mass extractors and it's amazing. Uh, there is so much mass to be had and it is so easy to get to T3 or do aggressive T1, whatever you want to do. But when one of these little guys gets through, it is annoying as all get out because typically you don't have any land forces at all because you have a bunch of people in front of you. You're assuming nothing will get through. 
and then it does and it sets you behind on your build and it is so incredibly annoying. Anything to throw the other team off balance is something you should be doing. When you're on the receiving end, it's annoying. When you're on the giving end, it is such a satisfying feeling. And that was a successful hunter there. That was going to be an engineer and radar kill and then a bit of an annoyance forcing the ACU to move aside. When you move the ACU away from where it was intended to be, that is always a bonus, and this Mantis is probably going to pick up a mass extractor kill. And Bomber coming in. It's going to be close. Nope, saved with 71 health. Very close. Ah, I did not know that units could pass over that spot. So there is a pass through the hills. You do not actually have to run all the way around the nose. That is handy to know. I will have to keep that in mind next time I am doing my run-bys on Wonder. I think people drastically underestimate the power of T1 air. There's a little bit of T1 in the air right now. Uh, we've got a couple of bombers for the southern side, not really anything for the north, and one or two interceptors. It is so much fun to get to the T3 stage, it really is. And the units there are cool, you've got the strap bomber, you've got the gunships for a lot of factions, you've got access to the ASF which can intercept anything, but the problem with that is the fastest you can rush it is say 9 minutes, and we're halfway to 9 minutes. Um, I think that's about the earliest you can pull off one RAS on this map, or two RAS actually. and make anything for yourself without stalling horrifically. You can get a strap bomber out earlier than that, but you will pay for it in eco. Um, and there's so much damage to be done before then. You could potentially mercy snipe one, someone. I have seen drops pulled off by the rear player. Even aggressive T1 bomber builds from the rear back here. By the time the other air reacts to it, you can cause a huge huge amount of damage and if you pair that with an aggressive push from the other players coordination it's a team game um you can collapse a side very easily in the early game so it's just something to keep in mind to try um the last couple times i've done air on wonder i have tried the super aggressive early build and it paid for itself two out of three times um sometimes it does put you slightly behind on eco which can be bad if the other player does a direct T3 rush, but I have found that in a lot of cases, more often than not, the bombers and the early air push does more good than harm. And here we see some excellent use of a T1 bomber. The Aeon Aurora does of course have the range advantage, but they also have the lowest health tank at 140. These things are so susceptible to bombers, it is quite ridiculous. They also have the twitchy move. Um, when you first give a move order, the tanks tend to twitch in one spot and then move after that. And sometimes that is enough to actually let the bomber drop and you don't get a successful dodge. And then these tanks are also the slowest T1 tanks. All that pairs together to make them extremely susceptible to T1 bombers. And you can see he was killing off two, three, four at a time with passes. It's a good, easy way to do a bunch of damage. As long as you kill two tanks, the bomber paid for itself. So even if it's kamikaze runs, those are well worth it considering the fact that unless you have gun on your ACU, you're not actually going to be able to get in range of the tanks to kill them, which is huge, huge problem for you. Alrighty then. Orange is doing the direct build. It looks like he's got some T2 mechs down. We got a T2 air factory up pushing swift wind so he does plan to stay in T2 at least for a little while maybe not too long actually that may be a specter no that's a swift wind when it pops out we will know for sure and there it is yes swift wind king of the skies at this stage of the game We've already got T2 online for Orion, and he is getting the T2 gens up first. He does have a T2 engineer online already. Got that generator up, and he is going to have a power advantage. So, I misspoke. I was incorrect. This is going to be a stay at T2 air for a little while for Rage of 100 Suns. Epic name still. I love that. And then... This is going to be our T3 air rush, I think. Yes. A second generator going down. 
and all is well. We've got two ACUs on the southern side. These are probably gun upgrades. Saz may actually have double gun. Yes, he does. Look at the enormous range on that. I take that back. Ah, bright red ring. Sorry, peoples. He has the damage upgrade, not the range upgrade. The yellow is always there. When the red goes away, that's when he has the expanded range. And he is going to be helping push with Speedy Gonzalez, who also has the gun upgrade. So this is double gun, single range upgrade. This would have been better to wait, I think, or to for Speedy to assist Saz, because that gun upgrade on Aeon is just ridiculous. If you can get the extra range on that, they would be pretty much impervious to T2 point defense should they get thrown down. These guys are just going to munch their way through Code Pants units. Two ACUs can pretty much take on any amount of T1 spam if they have the gun upgrade. You just pair with each other and overcharge the oncoming units to death as you kite. Then they've got all their units with them. Blue is coming down, aptly named the Defender. He is going to try to come to the aid of his teammate. He has a T2 ACU and not a whole lot else. There are zero units on the board, and this is what turtling gets for you, folks. You end up failing in the long run on any kind of open map, because if you don't have units, you can't react. You're pretty stationary. We've got point defense here, which is not doing a whole lot of good for all the units overflowing the southern side. And since you have no units and you're building point defense, this guy, knowing that you can't push, can safely come to the aid of his left side teammate, and that's a 2-com push, which is bad, oh so terrible. And the damage has already been done, unfortunately. Blue is here, but he should have stopped in the back to build T2 point defense to prevent further pushing. If he throws his own commander into the fight, he is not going to be able to build any kind of point defense or anything that would save his teammate. He's throwing down T1 point defense in the back and he is going to run because he's got two ACUs hitting him. He does not have the gun upgrade either, so he is going to be outranged. He does have mobile shield coming to his aid, so that is a plus. Also, if you're dealing with gun commanders, you never ever want to build your point defense right next to each other. Because all that means is, yup, two overcharges to the face and all of those point defense go down at once. No help for it. Need to space those things out to prevent that. So the two ACUs are going to continue to push overcharging as they go, eating up that build power, killing off the eco and bad news for the northern team gonna throw down a t2 point defense here but again way too close to the fight that t2 point defense is gonna get spotted and shot down very quickly i would think egg roll pretty much sitting stationary on his side silver wing is gonna throw down a t2 point defense to try pushing this way but holy cow that's early t3 it is 10 minutes on the nose and we got our first harbinger coming out so that is going to be tough to stop on the left, on the right side, excuse me. And that is going to present some issues. We'll have to keep an eye on that over there. And it looks like we are pushing swift winds. Got resource allocation upgrade going down on the ACU. That is a chest upgrade, yes. And spinny map. Okay, so Mongeese are coming online. I'm not sure that Mongeese is the right choice here. He is committed to the whole point defense thing, which again, with the building point defense too close to the fight, here comes the artillery, casually wiping that from the face of the map, and still building, wasting mass essentially. He is pouring mass into a point defense that shall never do anything good, and that is basically exactly what you don't want to do. Harbinger is out. That is going to outrange, outrun, and outgun anything in this army over here. Theoretically, if you kited well enough, this single Harbinger over the course of this group of units running from right here to over here, that Harbinger could probably kill the entire army by itself, taking for granted that you could easily dodge all of the artillery fire, and since these are Lobos, that would be easily feasible. Two Harbingers is even more bad news. So at this point, Silverwing better hope that he has the gun upgrade on his commander, which he does not. Why do people never get the gun upgrade? It hurts my very soul. If you have the range from that, you can step in with the Harbingers unless uh, there is some serious micro going on from that player. And you should be able to overcharge the early Harbingers that come out. But since there's no upgrades on that ACU, that is not an option, so it's a moot point for discussion. And the Defender 
again throwing down point defense. Something that you can do that will drastically help in this kind of situation is to place your ACU not in an exposed position, but further forward than you might feel is safe and build the point defense behind you. Especially if you're in the green on your HP because you can soak damage with your commander and kind of block the T2 point defense with your own ACU and get it built behind you. And the range is gonna be huge on that. So that T2 point defense will easily be able to cover everything. Then your ACU is already in front and you will be able to block for your point defense. And that way you can easily kill off all of this that's here. And building T1 point defense in this kind of situation is honestly kind of a dumb thing to do because there is exclusively T1 artillery in this army. And that is just going to have no trouble at all running over all of that. Kind of sad to watch. Harbingers are in the base. This is definitely what you do not want to have happening. There was a T3 upgrade started on this factory, but it is far too little too late. Um, Harbingers are going to eat away at all of the build power here and then start chewing through some of the other units. You can see it's barely down to half shield health, and we're already 24 and 35 kills on those. They're going to vet up very quickly on all those T1 units in the back. And then we've got some more Harbingers on the north side. That is a sixth Harbinger hitting the field for the Northern Army. And these four are going to move around to the left. That's going to be some much needed assistance for the left side. Code Pants still has most of the health on his ACU. I would push a little bit to help block for Defender as he's getting his point defense down. And it looks like now Saz still doesn't have the range upgrade. Nope. That is something that he should seriously consider putting on his ACU because he could hit the point defense from all the way back there. Speedy Gonzalez is in range though. So he's going to land an overcharge, kill that thing off, and second point defense coming up. Another thing to consider, there is a wreck there. Not really a whole lot of rec reclaim value once that thing gets overcharged, but you will be able to build a point defense twice as fast on that exact spot if you can maintain the position. We've got two Harbingers moving down here and two Harbingers on this side. These guys are really paying for themselves. As far as how long they've survived and how much they've killed, we got 64 kills there and 49 on the other, which is just ridiculous. These guys are still chewing away at the back side of this base. I was extremely worried about the left side. It looked like this was going to be an easy win for the southern team but then this t3 coming on the field and we have a strap bomber that is gonna mess some things up there's gonna be some serious damage to the southern eco at this rage does have his resource allocation so the power generators going down is not necessarily the end of the world but you still don't want to be losing those there's a Restore coming out, which I think is actually a good decision. I know I've said a lot of times that most of the time I'm against building Restores uh, because T2 gunships simply do more damage and Restores lose mass for mass to ASF. So unless you're worried about unit cap or you have more build power and mass than you know what to do with, um, ASF is a better option than Restores and T2 gunships do more damage. But he has no other option than to build gunships right now and at least the Restore is going to lay down some damage on that Strat Bomber and any ASF that are on the way. Swift Winds are moving after the Strat Bomber. Going to pull back and try to protect the Restore. I'm not sure. There's really no good decision to make here. Nothing that's going to help. We got Blue and Red pulled back into the base. Speedy Gonzalez and Saz finally getting a, an upgrade. I think that is going to be the other gun optimistically it may be the t2 that is on the same arm we'll just have to see when it comes up this harbinger looks like it's not long for the world 94 kills and 75 kills that is incredible and all of those others um, i imagine these got overcharged wherever they went and a drop Drop around the left side. Dropping engineers. Not a good spot to place them, unfortunately. They are immediately going to get killed off. I like the thought. 
probably trying to get in on the reclaim, but it's just not going to work out. There's so many units in the area. Oh, not good. T3 Air Factory has gone down to these two Harbingers. These two Harbingers right here may have single-handedly won the game. I'm just saying. 103 kills and 82 kills. <laughs> and still ticking. Both of these guys are on five veterancy. We got T2 gunship coming out to try and take care of them, but we're talking about 6,900 health and a full shield on both of them. So that's going to take some doing to kill those. They're still going to wreak some havoc. And five Harbingers in a group moving down from the side. Now we did finally get T3 online. There is a T3 NG out, but uh, that NG is going to die pretty much immediately and not going to accomplish anything. back up in the yellow the regen on these harbies is fearsome We're, we've got uh, 15 hp per second with that five re or five veterancy getting my words confused and we've got some more harbingers actually these look like they were gifted from the egg roll to code pants and code pants only has his acu at this point so he's sitting on an upgrade these were given to him, and he is pretty much just going to sit there and micro him because it's the only units that he's got, so he can do whatever he wants. There's no sacrifice to be made for APM. Harbinger is going to be able to knock out this engineer and point defense, I think. Harby can shoot over the top of walls. It's going to be pestered by bombers, though. We've got, oh, ten or so bombers. Should be able to deal with that pretty quickly, down to 600 health. And Mike Ring and Circles I'm gonna get winged by a bomber there. We'll just have to see how long he can keep that alive. Monitor that on the side. Saw's pulling back here. Which upgrade did he get? That was the T2 upgrade. So no gun range for him. 290, still alive. Confusing the bombers trying to kill off the rest of these mass extractors. Oh, the shield is back up. So as long as you can micro long enough to get the shield back up, you've got some more health bought for you. Pulling back up to 500 or so HP with the help of that. And forgotten about and set still for a minute. Ah, there we go. Oh! <laughs> ACU death. Whoopsie daisy. But that was a Harvey kill. We know what killed him. There is no doubt about it. When you see a clump of Harbingers that large, Sitting right next to an ACU nuke, nah, odds are you can safely guess at what the cause of death was. And that Harbinger is still going. It hit 5th Vet and gained some health, and it is going to successfully kill another Mass Extractor, maybe? Nope, going for the Hydro. At this point in the game, not sure why you would specifically target the Hydro at the expense of a Harbinger, but to each his own. Last Mass Extractor is going to go down, and that is that. Saws down as well. Nice kill there. <laughs> A beautiful thing, Mazer comms. Just awesome. <laughs> okay. Well, that was definitely a turnaround game. I was not anticipating that. That was beautiful teamwork from the center and left to break red and move him back and then just egg roll, pretty much steamrolled the entire map with Harbingers. And when the Harbingers come out, they are so hard to deal with. Aeon T3 is very strong early. Now, if you can get the opposing T3 units online, Harbingers are kind of paper. Once you get Percivals and Bricks, they die just very, very quickly. There's not enough health there to maintain. Othams against Harbingers, I think the Othams will win, but it's not as decisive. Um, the Harbingers are significantly faster, so they can run away from the Othams. So they are kind of a cross between a raiding and a main unit. They fill both roles and do them pretty well. Of course, by the time Aeon gets to late T3, you're going to have GCs online. So that is um, that is how you make up for it in the late game. Harbingers paired with GCs. Rage of a Hundred Suns is going to move up. He's taking the bullet, dying with grace. There's the nuke, and that just leaves Speedy Gonzalez. 
that was not a Mazer comm after all. I will have that on the fast action replay though, so we will know, you know by now, what killed him. I do not though, because I fail at life and I am a miserable commentator because I miss things. So, <laughs> you've got me to live with though. Admittedly, I am a bit rusty from the break, so hopefully I'll be back at the speed as we move on through this week. And we will see what other games get sent in. I do need replays, by the way. Anybody who has good, solid replays with good play, um, please don't send me steamrolls, because steamrolls are not a whole lot of fun for anybody to watch. I had several of them submitted. I do like getting games from people and watching them, but unfortunately, I can't cast them when the game's over in 15 minutes and one side is just completely and utterly dominant. Anywho, that is game. Well done by the Northern team. Eggroll especially, definitely the MVP on that one, saved his team with a couple of Harbingers. And everyone else did fantastically well as well. Alrighty guys, I will see you on Thursday for the regularly scheduled cast. I do not know if I'm going to be doing a live cast on Saturday or not. There are some things that need to be taken care of as my wife and I are setting up house and doing things and we've got to make a trip on Saturday. So it is to be announced whether or not there will be a live cast. But either way, I will see you guys on Thursday. As always, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you then.